Okay, you've got Nina installed and now you're raring to go. But it's like, where do you go? What do you do? What do you configure in order to get yourself going? Hi, I'm Dave Verban Astro and today we're going to begin talking about setting up Nina. And the first place that you need to go in order to begin your initial configurations is going to be in the options tab. So it's split up into multiple different sections, as you can see here. We got a profile section, and then we got a general section followed by primary UI color scheme and alternate UI user interface, if you don't know what UI stands for, color scheme, and then um, astrometry, and then plugin repository. And it's pretty straightforward. So profiles. Profiles are collections of configuration information that may be related to a particular rig setup. So for instance, for this rig, which is going to be a Quattro uh, 150P, it's going to come in, the, there will end up being four different profiles. Because I'm going to use that Quattro with a mono camera and with a color camera. And then I've got two different mounts that I can put this thing on. I can put this thing on my Lost Mandy G11 mount, or I can put it on my Skywatcher EQ6R Pro mount. And so with all of those different permutations, I'm going to have up to four different profiles. To do profiles, you've got options here. It will always come up with a default profile. It just always does. Uh, I've been in here playing a little bit, and so I kind of renamed it to just default because it's default and then whatever the date is, the date and timestamp of when that profile was generated by Nina. And if there is no profile, Nina will always generate a default profile for you. If you want to add a profile down here in this section right here, there's a plus button for adding a profile. There's the two double pages to copy. So we can copy all the configuration information from one profile into a new profile. And we can also, you got a trash can here, you can delete a profile. Now, if a profile is active, you cannot delete it. It has to be inactive for you to be able to delete it. And so if I had a different profile in here, I could click on it and then this last button is load profile. It would load that particular profile. And then the one that's currently marked active would no longer be marked as active. And then I can go ahead and I can highlight it and then delete it. So just to kind of show you how that works here. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to create a new profile and there's my new profile. Now I want to delete that profile. So I highlight this profile. I'll click on load profile and now it becomes the active profile. And then I can click what was the active profile and I can delete it and boom, there it is. It's gone. And let's say that I want to make a copy of this profile because only one configuration parameter is going to change. Let's say that I'm going from one mount to another mount and all I need to do is go in and change what mount this thing is going to be sitting on. And But everything else is the same. Then I can just copy that profile and that's what this button here does. It will copy it and create it as a copy. And then uh, I can go in and I can rename that and I'll show you that here in just a second. So that's essentially how profiles work. I'm going to go ahead and delete that one. We'll go here into the default profile. Now if you want to rename the profile and give it a description, you come over here to the general section. And you see here it's got name and description. And this is where the name of the profile sits. And we're going to change that. So I'm going to call this initial profile. Okay. I'm going to call it home mono and G11. What that means is that the profile, my initial profile that I'm going to create 
is going to be a profile where my location is going to be my home backyard and it's going to be mono using my ASI 2600mm Pro camera and it's going to be sitting on my Lost Mandy G11 mount and as soon as I click out of here it renames that profile you see it here home mono G11 and I can say here that this is home backyard using ASI 2600mm on Lost Mandy G11 I have to click out of it in order for it to there we go and you see the description right here so here's what the profile name is here's a description of what that profile is and you want to be kind of descriptive on your profiles especially if you end up creating a whole lot of profiles so that's pretty much covers profiles so now we got the other general information here to deal with and the first thing of course is what language uh, Nina supports all these different languages so if you want this in Turkish or Portuguese or if you want it in French or Chinese but for me because I'm an English speaker from the United States of course my language of choice is going to be English US and if you notice it, it defaults to English British and you can see that it uses the British spelling scheme and as soon as you change this to American English or United States uh, it uses the American spelling scheme that's really the only difference between those two so you select your language and then font again I just accept the default font but if you want something different like let's say maybe you like I don't know Calabri then it changes everything into a Calabri font um, or maybe you like Georgia font so there you are everything's now in Georgia font um, Javanese font if you like that kind of font so basically you can configure how you want all this to be I'm just going to go back to Segway UI just because or you know regular you can do semi bold or uh, you can make it uh, black which really makes it really bold or you can just go regular which is what I'm going to do the next two options are for the sky atlas image folder and the sky survey cache folder so what you're going to want to do is uh, da, 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 da. where is my web browser okay so we're out here we're going to go to the download section and what the Nina folks have done if you go down here to the very very bottom of the download page you'll see that there's a section here called miscellaneous and here you got a sky atlas image repository and then you've got the offline sky map, uh, map cache and you download those each one is well the sky atlas image repository is a gigabyte and then the off sky map is two gigabytes and if you go into your downloads folder you'll see that you get two files one is called the sky atlas image repository and one is called the framing assistant cache and these have all the images that you would normally would have to wait for it to be downloaded they're all right here for you to be able to use which means that you can use this at a remote site and not worry about trying to um, get those images because otherwise you end up with just little circles of the proximate location of where the object is and it gets very difficult to do any kind of framing if all the, that you're doing is framing off of circles I install these into my Nina directory now you see here that it has an in local Nina framing assistant cache I just install it into Nina directory that seems to work okay for me so if I go here to this PC and I go into my local drive go into program files and I go into Nina nighttime imaging and astronomy you'll notice that there's the framing assistant cache and here's the sky atlas 
uh, Sky Atlas Image Repository Directory. Essentially, it just has images of, it just has all these different images of the different objects that you can possibly select and it basically stitches them all together when you go into the Sky Atlas. It, pretty seamlessly behind the scenes. So once you've got those downloaded and installed, and you can install them anywhere, they can be they don't have to be installed where I install them, that's just where I install them, just so that way I install it and I can forget about it. You can install it other places, it doesn't really matter. So for the Sky Atlas itself, I'm going to just click on the ellipsis there and we're going to go into this PC and we're going to go into my C drive and program files. Again, this is where I installed it. You may install it someplace else. And this is going to be the Sky Atlas folder. And there we go. We click on it and we say select folder. And there we are. Now for the Sky Survey Cache folder, again, we're going to not use what it is suggesting because I don't want to use it. It's not where I installed it. And we'll go into the framing assistant cache and boom, there we go. And that's that. And when we get to the Sky Atlas and the framing, you'll see where that is very, very helpful, especially if you're offsite, you don't have internet access, that becomes incredibly, incredibly helpful. Okay, the next option here is for profile chooser on startup. If you have multiple different profiles with different configuration parameters, you're going to want to be able to select which profile you want Nina to launch when it opens up. It prompts you, it has a little box, it says which profile would you like to use? And it will have the list. And it, the last profile that you opened will be the profile that it will go with unless you select another profile. Sometimes that makes it really quick and easy. If you're doing multiple nights with the same configuration setup, you can just say launch and it will just go ahead and launch using the profile that you had used the night before or the previous time that you had launched Nina. So if you've got multiple profiles, that becomes a really important piece. So that way you don't have to go back into here and you saw how that I loaded another profile, you don't have to go in here and load the right profile. You can do it when Nina launches. Advanced settings uh, here, auto update source. You can go either with beta, nightly, or release. In this particular case, I'm gonna go with beta. And you can see we've got beta eight and I'll download that a little bit later and update it. But essentially, they're just bug fixes at this point in time. Normally, what I would do is I would set this to release and forget about it. There's a couple scopes because I like to live dangerously and I like to live on the edge. I will we'll actually check the nightlies out and use the nightlies, which I find are generally really good. And generally, I don't have really major issues. But for now, I'll just say beta because I'm running a beta version here. It's going to be version 3, but we're still in a beta uh, stage of development. They haven't gone to release yet. But when they do, it's essentially going to be the same thing that you're seeing now. It's just a few bugs behind the scenes will be remediated. Typical software development process. Single imaging tab layout. You can either turn that on or turn it off. Uh, when enabled, the imaging tab will only have one layout for all profiles instead of being profile dependent. So if you set up your imaging tab the way that you like it and you want that to stay regardless of what profile you set up, then you can turn this thing on. And as you can see here, it would require a restart. Um, but again, that would be your choice for right now. I'm just going to leave it off because 
I may want to change things a little differently depending if I'm using a color camera versus a mono camera. I may not have a lot of the same options set up for either of those. Um, so I may do it a little bit differently. So, but if I turn, if it turns out that I do use the same layout for all the different options, then I would just click on use single imaging tab layout. So that's your particular choice. Here's logging level. Uh, I keep it at default info, but you can do error logging or warning logging or information or debug or trace. If, debug and trace, if you're working on an issue, it's a nightly build and the developers ask you to turn that on and then provide them a log. Um, after an imaging session, this is where you go in and change that. But for right now, I just leave it at the default. And again, the polling instance is two seconds for logging and then image save queue size. I leave all this default. And then we got hardware ac acceleration. And what you notice here for a lot of these, if you just highlight, they tell you what those options are. So for instance, hardware acceleration, this enables or disables hardware accelerating rendering of the application. So if you've got like a uh, video card that can help in rendering uh, images, then you can turn on hardware acceleration. And I think it goes on by default. So that's the advanced settings. And then the primary UI color scheme, this is pretty straightforward. You can choose which is gonna be your primary color scheme when you first launch Nina, and then you have an alternate color scheme that you can set up. And as you click down here, there's a lot of different options for color schemes, and you can create your own color schemes. I generally just tend to leave it as where it's set up. If you want to change color schemes, like you launch into, maybe you got this set up as primary, but then when you actually start imaging, you want to change to your alternate color scheme. If you come down over here, down here in the bottom here, you can see right here that toggles colors to alternate color scheme. So if I click on that, now we are in the alternate color scheme and this is the color this was that other alternate color scheme that we had set up you can see it right here and you can go in here and you can tweak this and play with this to your heart's content I generally tend not to use this feature uh, I will set up an alternate um, color scheme for when I'm out at a dark sky site when I'm out remote especially if I'm imaging with other astrophotographers last thing I need is light blaring out of my laptop screen. And you can go in and you can configure how you want these things set up. So the next thing that I really wanted to touch upon, and I'm already going really, really late, is um, astrometry. And this is where your site location is. And you can get your site location from multiple different ways. One is you can import a location from a um, GNSS device, which is basically a GPS device. Or you can just input your site latitude, site longitude, and the site elevation. Now I happen to know that when I first was using Nina, trying to figure out what to put in here wasn't as easy as you might think. If you're new to doing astronomy and you're new to understanding the different ways in which um, degrees are noted, there is decimal degrees and then there's the regular um, degrees, minutes, and seconds notation. Nina uses the decimal notation and to go from one to the other can be a little bit tricky especially um, I know that I don't know how to do it myself and so what I usually do is I usually hook up 
my Pegasus Astro uh, Uranus Metro sensor and it will tell me what my latitude and longitude is and you can see it right here this latitude and longitude is right there which I'm kind of surprised because I had this thing set up before and it would not be able to get data because while well, it's been raining out and so satellite uh, reception has come in and it's come out but I use this to set up my astrometry here so what I'm going to do is show you uh, I'm going to go into my go into my equipment tab here and which is the next tab down from general and you got your GNSS device and you notice that you've got a NEMA serial I have a little serial dongle that is a GPS device you've got the Prima Luce Eagle that you can use and you've got the Pegasus Astro Uranus meter so I'm going to go ahead and change that and then I can come back up here to general and this right here import location from my GNSS device so I click on that and it will automatically fill in my location for me. It fills in my site latitude, my longitude, my site elevation and if I had a custom horizon file I could actually do up a custom horizon file and I can load it and I have one I just don't have it on this particular PC. So that's how you can do it if you've got a GPS device connected. What if you don't have a GPS device? When I first ran Nina, I did not have a Pegasus Astro Uranus station because they didn't have it. It hadn't come out yet, and all I had uh, was basically the internet and trying to figure out, okay, this doesn't take um, degrees, minutes, and seconds. It does this decimal notation. Well, what do I do? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you come here to your browser, uh, not that browser, but this browser. There we go. Here is my home in beautiful sunny Levine, which isn't very, very sunny right now. But anyways, here is what you got is you've got this. And I'm going to copy that. And then you can find on latlong.net, you can find a tool here called degrees minutes seconds to decimal degrees and I can plug this in oops so we're at 33 degrees 22 minutes and I rounded it up to 27 seconds and then we're at 27 seconds and then I did the same thing for latitude so here's my degrees, here's my minutes, and here's my seconds. And then you just click on convert to decimal degrees. And there you are. There's your decimal degrees. And let's see how good the GPS is. So we have 33, 374. This says 375. Not a big deal. Uh, we got negative 112 to 150. So this probably would round up to 151 but again not a big deal now for those of you who know latitude and longitude you know that anything west of the meridian line which is the zero degree line the Greenwich uh, mean time line every anything to the west of that is a negative and anything to the east of that would be a positive number I live in Phoenix, which is definitely to the west of Greenwich, and so I, this would normally would be 112 degrees, 0 0.1508333333 west. Well, to denote west, we use a negative, and that's why you see the negative here. For those in the southern hemisphere, your latitude lines if you live in the southern hemisphere if you live below the equator you're going to use a negative in your decimal notation for degrees latitude 
And again, those of us in the northern hemisphere, those of us from the equator north, will use a positive number. So it gets a little tricky sometimes. But that's essentially how you can figure out your positioning. So use Google Maps, locate where you live, and then go into long, uh, lat, latlong.net and use that calculator in order to convert over and you're good to go. The only thing that you're not going to be able to get is your elevation. And for that, I would just Google for me, like Phoenix, what is the elevation of Phoenix? Of course, everything in here is in meters. You can see there are meters. Uh, so you have to convert if you get feet, how many feet above sea level, you're going to find yourself a converter to go from feet to meters. They're all over the internet and you just put that in and get a basic altitude. So here's where plugin, plugin repositories. Uh, Nina basically manages the plugins. You just go out there and you can just download them. But if somebody creates a plugin that isn't found on the Nina site, then you can go ahead and you can add that repository. You just hit the click button here and you put in what the URL link is to that particular repository and it will add it to it and then it will show up on your plugins as an available plugin for you to download. So that's the general tab and I'm going a little more detail here because some of how you set up, especially how you set up your profiles, is really, really important and getting your Sky Atlas and your Sky Survey cache folder set up is really important, especially if you go to remote sites. Um, your color scheme can be important. Um, your astrometry is definitely important. You need to know where you're at. So that way, when you go into the Sky Atlas, the Sky Atlas is able to function correctly because it knows where you're at. So it knows what objects to fetch when you go in to go fetch them and you see kind of where those objects are in the nighttime sky, where they are in terms of how many degrees above the horizon they are. All that it really depends upon how you set up this particular um, values right there as to where you're located at. Um, but if you found this at all to be helpful or interesting, Please go ahead and feel free to subscribe. Hit the subscribe button down there. Hit the like button if you like this and you'd like to see more deep dives like this. And um, yeah, until next time, clear skies and happy guiding.